So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about clay soil. This is a new class. And just as a reminder, 10 minute university handouts that you have received are all posted online. They've all been vetted by OSU scientists before they're posted and shared with you. So this is not just stuff that I did the research and reached the conclusion myself. And in doing this new presentation, because there is so much information available, and figuring out how to condense it into a short class is very challenging. And to make sure the accuracy of both my PowerPoint and the handout, I enlisted the help of two OSU scientists, Dr. Sam Njima, who's a soil scientist, and Dr. Alan Sams, who is the Dean of Agricultural Sciences. And it's because of their help that I'm able to speak with you with great confidence. So, what I would like to achieve, and that relies on you, partnership with you, is that this talk will help you learn practical gardening tips working in clay soil, gain an understanding of soil structure, and develop an appreciation for soil life. And again, we have a lot of resources at the website cmastergardeners.org videos and handouts. Uh, for example, this class is video recorded and it will be posted there. So I'm asking you to sit through a very dry subject. <laughs> and I'm also asking you to please save your questions for later because we have very little time to cover a lot of things. So as a reward, pretty garden picture. <laughs> So most of us know soils by their mineral particles, sand, silt, and clay. Sand is gritty, silt is smooth, clay is sticky when it's wet, hard when it's dry, and big differences in their sizes. But really, the biggest difference that matter, sand and silt are shaped like little rocks. Clay are shaped like flat sheets. In addition, they carry a lot of negative charges. And this means only one thing. What has a lot of negative charges will attract stuff with positive charges. And in the soil water, we're talking about calcium, magnesium, potassium, iron, all kinds of stuff that plants use for nutrients. If you have clay, you have a natural reservoir of nutrients built in. The important thing is for us to know how to get that released and available for the plants to use. So most soil have more than one of sand, silk, clay, possibly two or three. And the soil that has roughly equal portion of all three is called loam. And clay, True clay must have at least 55% clay content in it. That's not important. What's important is we know clay is highly fertile, lots of nutrients packed in it. We know clay compared to other soils types have great water holding capacity and we know it drains very slowly. Those two go hand in hand. So the question for gardeners is what do we do? in order to make the best out of clay. I'm going to offer you some short-term approaches. If you're getting ready to plant into a bed of clay soil in the next couple months, and then I'm going to give you some long-term approaches. So the short-term approach is the first step is do a soil test. It's important to know what's there before we do anything to it. And since clay soil is already very rich in nutrients, it may be a total waste of time and money to buy more, add more, and work it in. And the second thing is to add organic matter. And in this instance, we're trying to get the soil ready for planting. Use only 
fully decomposed organic matter. What is organic matter? It's stuff that used to live. It lived once. So yard debris, manure are good examples. Organic matter does a number of things to clay soil. It helps the clay particles to release the nutrients and make them available for plant use. It helps improve the soil structure. It improves the drainage and it helps improve water holding capacity. So now you say, wow, sounds like the miracle answer. More, the more, the merrier. And the answer is no. Figure out what's in your soil, then determine, uh, determines how much to add, if any. So here is a chart to show if your current soil organic matter is less than 5%, and your soil test will tell you that, then add 3 to 5 inches. If you have already 5 to 10%, you may add 1 to 2 inches, but if you have more than 10%, do not add more. This is based on most recent research in the last couple years in the Portland metro area gardens. Good gardeners have been adding organic matter year after year after year after year. They end up with soil that is super high in organic matter. The ideal range is 5 to 7. There are gardens that are 13, 30 percent organic matter. And the problem that comes with too much organic matter is the high level of phosphate. They go hand in hand. Phosphate does a number of bad things to plants when it's too much. Number one, it inhibits development of mycorrhizae. I'm going to say more about that later. Number two, it inhibits the plant's uptake of iron, so it makes the plant look like it's nutrient deficient. And number three, runoff is going to pollute our rivers and lakes. So don't do too much. Once you add organic matter and work it into the soil, the soil will become all fluffy, nice structure, easy to work with, but those benefits are short-lived because organic matter is destined to break down. That's why it's a good thing to add to soil. It's going to be used by your soil microbes. So if you have a vegetable garden, annual bed, you be repeating that year after year in order to get that same short-lived benefit. But if you have a garden bed with ornamental plants, stuff that live long, that's not practical. So I'll talk about a long-term approach later. When your soil is ready to plant, the one thing that you need to remember is avoid interface in the root zone. What do I mean by that? An interface is where two types of soil media come together. So example, I take a container plant and I dig a hole in the native soil and put it in there. The container media is one type. The native soil is a different type. Where the interface come together, it's a barrier to movement of water, nutrient, air, you name it, roots. So to avoid interface, the recommendation is you remove the planting media before you put the plant in the ground and do not backfill. Don't put nice fluffy stuff into the hole. Somebody looks a little concerned. So let me review the proper planting steps. The hole should be in the shape of a shallow bowl, no deeper than the depth of the root. If you shake up the container media, you can see really the size of the root. And it should be at least twice as wide. The excavated soil should be broken up into smaller pieces and take out roots, rocks, any foreign things. And then some of the soil put back into the hole in the shape of a mound, spread the roots like a starfish over this mound. Then add batches of soil, water, let it drain, add more soil, water, let it drain. Do not do the temping or pressing down the soil. Okay, Just let water do its thing. Let gravity firm up your soil. 
your reward. You survived the first 10 minutes. OK, let's switch gear. You've learned the short-term approach to gardening in clay soil. Let's look at healthy soil. Ideally, it should be about half of it is pore space, gaps, holes, reserved for air and water. Those mineral particles should only be about 45%. And the rest, the 5%, are organic matter. And most of it is dead stuff that's being thoroughly decomposed called humus. Only a small amount are living things in the form of roots and organisms. Earthworms, bacteria, fungi, springtail, whatever, you name it, that you can find in soil. OK. I want to focus our attention on organic matter, those living things. Most of them are too small for our eyes to see, but they are the answer to healthy soil. It's very inconvenient because we can't see them and we don't know how well they're doing. But let's take a look at how organic matter gives soil its structure. The building block of soil is PET. And this illustration shows those brown color chunks, that's the mineral particles, being tied or bound together by the fungal hyphae, those long arm-like things or string-like things, bacteria, because they're sticky, so they work like biological glue, and organic matter because they have charges. So the charges work with the other things to hold everything together. So pads will stick together into bigger clumps. And um, it's a very dynamic process because the pad only lasts about four weeks. So there are new ones continuously being made and old ones fall apart. And this picture shows what healthy soil is supposed to look like. Kind of chunky, dark, and lots of holes in it. Now, these holes are very, very important. So this illustration shows a whole bunch of pads being stuck together. So one pad is that collection of orange mineral particles, the green, organic matter, and the blue is water droplets. All right? So there are lots of little clumps of these. So that represents the different pads being stuck together. Now, you can see within the pad, there are empty spaces. And those are called micropores. And between the pads, you can also see space, and those are called macro pores. So when we water, water fills the space in the pad, the micro pore first. Then the extra water flows out through the macro pores and drain out. The water in the micro pores within those pads continue to be available to the plant roots to use. So in clay soil, that water stays for a long time because it has tremendous water holding capacity. I've been saying how soil microbes are important, acting as biological glue to give the soil structure. But we also know there are other things that they do. Some of them are pathogens, and they can make, make plants sick. And many others have beneficial relationships with soil. And here's one example. Earlier, I talked about micro, uh, mycorrhizae and how mycorrhizae is inhibited when there is too much phosphate in the soil. Over enrich your soil with compost, you're not going to get mycorrhizae. Okay? So what is mycorrhizae? It's a beneficial association between the roots and the fungus. That's literally what it means. And they come together. You can see the picture of the root, which sort of is shaped like a T. 
And along the road, you can see all those big looking like bumps. That's where mycorrhizae is. Okay? And then you can see all those really fine white lines spread throughout the entire picture. And those are the fungal hyphae. So the beneficial association works this way. The plant will give about 5 to 20% of the carbon it makes, it fix from uh, photosynthesis and make carbohydrate, which is a form of sugar. So the plants are feeding some of the sugar it makes through the roots to the microbes. So the fungi will get food from the plant. And in exchange, it will get water and nutrients through this extensive network of its, uh, its uh, fungal hyphae underground because it can reach so much wider and farther than the plant roots can go. And what happens to the plants? It gets more drought tolerant. It does not need nutrients because the, the fungal hyphae is doing the work to get nutrients. And it also increased the roots stability underground. Good for everybody involved. So the stuff that comes out of the root, the liquid food, scientists called it exudates. So root exudates. The interesting thing is each species of plant has its own composition, its own recipe for making the exudates. And the content in the exudates appeal to a certain kind of microbe. Can you see what's going on there? Another reward. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to talk about some long-term strategies for working, getting the most out of a clay soil. This has been worked out in regenerative agriculture on farms, large scale, not tiny gardens, okay? And has been proven to work with lots of scientific research and published paper to back it up. And there are five steps, just five main points. The first one is keep your soil covered. We know mulch moderates the soil temperature, minimizes the water evaporation, uh, help protect the soil from compaction, does lots of good things. Organic mulch breaks down over time and slowly add organic matter to the soil. The video listed on that sheet um, is an uh, extensive talk on garden mulch materials. So if you're interested, check it out. The second step is minimize disturbance. What's disturbance? Digging, tilling, turning over the soil. Disturbance damages the soil structure and it kills soil life. Think about those fungal hyphae. Digging and tilling cut them up. Beneficial nematodes are extremely sensitive to disturbance. Tilling kills them. And it's good for weeds because there are lots of weed seeds dormant in our soil. Turn them over, give them some light, off they go. Something else bad that we tend not to think about, soil sequester carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. Turning it over, speeding up the decomposition by introducing oxygen in air into the soil uh, so the organic matter breaks down faster. It helps release this greenhouse gas carbon dioxide into the air. And we also know with clay soil, when it's wet, it's easy to damage. So be very careful when you do work the soil. It should not look like the picture on the top. Handful squeezed in your hand keeps its shape. Only when it looks like the picture on the bottom, a handful is squeezing the hand and it will break up readily. That's when your soil is ready for work. Number three, do not compact. All of us live and garden over compacted soil. Because when the house was built, that soil was compacted. But we can make sure it does not get more compacted. 
So if we stay off, rather than walking over it, that's my husband there, he never listens. <laughs> and if you mow, change your mowing pattern. If you run the wheelbarrow, change the pattern if you can, or go over designated path, and cover the soil with mulch so it's protecting it from rain. Lots of things we can do to remove or minimize compaction. And why is compaction bad? Because it squeezes out the pores, which are very important in healthy soil, and it makes the soil pads flat rather than rounded. The fourth thing is grow a diverse planting. I think for most gardeners, you'd be happy with this one. Grow, grow all kinds of plants. <coughs> and the reason is because, not only to please our aesthetic senses, but living roots, remember plants share food they make through the root exudates? And they, through doing that, they cultivate and feed soil microbes. Different plants make different kinds of food, share different stuff with different kinds of soil microbes. The more we have in diversity in the garden above ground, the more diverse the soil life. We know in agriculture, grow cover crop in order to extend this growing season and keep living roots growing year round. In the past, cover crops are cut down and tilled into the soil. How is it done in the era of no-till? Easy. Cut it down and lay it on top of the soil as some mulch. And over time, the mulch will break down and return organic matter into the soil. And planting is done actually through just making room. Push out the cover crop seed goes right in and it will grow through it. So what I'm telling you is not fanciful research finding. This is practiced on the farms with hundreds of acres, have been proven to work for decades. Okay? Um, so my question is, as gardeners, how can we put this to work or can we? And I want you to just take a moment and think about each one of these and show your hand, raise your hand. If you're willing to cover the soil, great. What about minimizing disturbance, digging and tilling? OK. I see some guys are kind of, uh, I don't know about that. What about reducing compaction? OK. What about growing a diverse planting? Hey, good. Here comes a reason to go to the nursery. What about keeping living roots year round? You know, if, we're, if you're growing vegetables, grow something in the off season. If you're growing perennial mixed border, you already have living roots growing year round, right? What about this last one? It's the hard one. Maybe allow plant debris to stay as mulch so you're not removing all of the organic content from your garden. OK, thank you. So if you still need some more convincing, Three soil samples, the one on the left from a 40-year no-till diverse cover crop farm. The one in the middle, same soil type, a farm a mile away, but regularly tilled. The soil on the right, different soil type, regularly tilled. What happens when they're dropped into water? The question is, do they hold together? Because remember, holding together means the pore spaces are intact. And what do the pores do? Hold air, hold water, allow roots to travel. That's the key to successful, healthy soil. OK, the till soil fall apart. The no-till diverse cover crop stay together. So now, simulated rain falls on the same three soil types. OK, what happens? The rainwater drains through the healthy soil. And the other regularly tilled soil 
have standing water. That's the difference. If we give soil a proper environment to develop and nurture the soil microbiology, over time, it will do its job. We have to learn patience, and we have to learn to be a good partner with nature. So thank you very much for coming.